All right, my friends, welcome back. We are here on Mother's Day night. I hope everybody uh, had a great Mother's Day. Matt, I'm glad that you're here to join us in a discussion. We are going to talk speaker talk. We are going to do loudspeaker directivity. What does that mean? Why it's important and how it affects the sound of how a speaker plays in your room. So that's what we want to get to. And this is a three-part series, my friends, just like what we did with the HDMI 2.1 with Phil Jones. I'm going to do this now with Matt. We're going to break this into three parts so it's not too long. So, uh, Matt, why don't you give us a quick definition of what loudspeaker directivity is? Yeah, I mean, basically, speaker directivity can be defined as uh, a measure or even just a concept of the way in which a speaker sprays sound out in different directions. So it's just a fancy term for almost like how the dispersion characteristic of the speaker, right? Yeah, exactly. It's just how does the sound come out of the speaker? You know, it's what does it look like in different directions? And there's and we're going to talk about that. And, and I'll say this particular presentation is more academic than practical for now. But it's because this academic knowledge is going to make the other two presentations, which are more practical, make a lot more sense. So in the absence of this, you guys would be pretty lost. And we're basically going to link up um, all three of these presentations so you can come back and watch them at your own leisure. And the PowerPoint presentations will be on our Patreon channel if you become a Patreon um, subscriber. So you can go back and look at this as well. So let's start. Do you see my screen, Matt? Yeah, yeah, we're ready to go. All right, so let's get rolling. So this cover image, I'll just point out, that is a kind of speaker directivity plot, a kind of polar plot, and it uses colors to represent the uh, amplitude. So the darker the red, the higher the amplitude. And then what you see is the plus and minus 90 degrees, which is the 180 degree arc across the front of the speaker. And what you, that funky shape is showing a speaker that basically has a pretty poor response with a pretty poor off-axis response. So it looks kind of like a warshack test maybe but uh it reminds me of those old atari i used to have an atari 2600 called yars revenge a game that's what it reminds me of if anybody played these 1980s 8-bit games it does look like that yeah and actually here's a similar type of graph uh that you can see and this is a much better performing speaker this is actually my speaker the the uh Gedley abbey 12 so um uh, directivity, as I mentioned earlier, is a measure of how a speaker sends sound in different directions. It's a common measure of a speaker. Oh, I should say a common measure of a speaker's directivity is the directivity index, which is a ratio of all or a specific set, such as the frontal hemisphere of sound relative to that of the direct sound. A low DI, when we say a low directivity index, uh, that means wide dispersion, and a high DI means narrow dispersion. So a narrow dispersion speaker would usually be like a horn-loaded speaker? Typically, it doesn't have to be, um, and I and I want to make sure I make that clear as we go through. But yes, waveguides and horns are used to narrow the dispersion of a speaker. I got gotcha. you. So here are some common ways of depicting the uh, polar response. So we measure a speaker at every angle around the speaker. We may measure, for instance, in five or ten degree increments. Uh, we measure a full sphere around the speaker. So typically, what we actually do at Audioholics is we'll do the vertical and the horizontal. And uh, if, if, as long as the speaker is small enough, I will say when the speakers are really large and heavy, we can't do the full sphere. But when the, as long as the speaker is small enough, what we'll do is we'll go to the center of the speaker and then we'll go all the way around to the back of the speaker. We spin the speaker to do that in uh, five or 10 degree increments. Uh, typically we stick to five degrees when we're in the frontal hemisphere and then we may go wider as we get toward to the side and back. And that's because the response doesn't change quite as much when you get back there. Um, and then in the vertical, uh, we actually, instead of doing just half of it, we have to do the whole thing. And that's because most speakers are not symmetric in the vertical, but they are symmetric in the horizontal. So we will actually have to measure more of it in the vertical. Um, but with very large, heavy speakers, we can't actually go all the way to the back of the speaker in the vertical uh, in if, both if directions. You have, if you have a vertical arrangement of drivers that are symmetrical um, and the tweeters centered in the cabinet, do you really need to do 360 or can you just do 180 and, and just assume the other side's the same? It, it, that's exactly right. Yeah. So if it is, if it's definitely symmetric and you're sure that the lobe is centered in the speaker, then you can essentially do half of the horizontal and half of the vertical. And then you just copy those over for the other half and it's fine. And we, we do that sometimes. Um, but not every, many speakers are not symmetric and they don't have what's called a symmetric lobe, uh, meaning that the response is not the same. If you go up from the center versus down. And so you do have to measure more of it. 
Um, so anyway, this depicts that. And you can see all of these are symmetric. Uh, they're all symmetric in this case because uh, we it was a symmetric speaker, so we only measured half of it and then uh, basically overlaid it to the other side. And um, the one that you see that's very colorful, you'll see two versions of the same speaker's response. One looks like very, very narrow. Now that is a waveguide speaker, but it looks really narrow in that top left one because that's actually the full 360. So that's showing the response all the way around the speaker. And the one that's in the lower right, which is the same speaker, that's showing only the frontal hemisphere. So that's only the front 180. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see that. And then the polar chart, the 360 polar chart in the upper right, I'll just mention, a lot of people see those in pro audio. We don't really like those for a few reasons. One is that they really only show what the polar response looks like at what one frequency. And I don't, I don't personally think they're particularly intuitive. So for like our readers, I just don't think that's a great way to display it. In the lower left is actually all the different frequency responses laid out over the different angles. Um, now, this can really only show 90 degrees at a time. It gets confusing if you try to do the full plus and minus 90 degrees. And so while a lot of people are used to seeing this, we really prefer to use those polar maps. And so that tends to, we'll, we'll usually give you both, but that's our preference. Gotcha. All right. So now I think probably you guys are all wondering, like, what does directivity look like? And what would perfect directivity look like? So here's some artificial uh, directivity plots that I've uh, put up here. I want to mention that with the exception of the lower right one, uh, these were pulled from a, a white paper that Dr. Earl Geddes had put together, and he offered to let me use these for this presentation, but I want to make sure I give him credit. So again, here, the red equals the max SPL, the blue would equal no SPL. Uh, figure eight represents a perfect CD speaker. So if you uh, if you look at like, for instance, that top left speaker there, that would be a speaker that is narrowing the dispersion uh, so that the response falls off. It gets quieter as you get to the sides at all frequencies equally and perfectly. Now, realistically, that's not feasible. And the reason for that is that it's very difficult to control directivity at low frequencies. To do that, the speaker has to get bigger and bigger and bigger or use more degrees of freedom, basically. And, this, and, and to do that, it's things like there's cardioid loading of the base drivers or adding additional base drivers and things like that. So the, there ends up getting to be a lot of tricks you have to apply to try to be able to lower the frequency. And so what happens instead is you see something that looks more like that upper right one, which is that the response widens at low frequencies and then stays nice and narrow, though, in the uh, low, we'll say, upper base through mid-range and treble. And so that, that upper right one is what I would call a realistic, perfect control directivity speaker or constant directivity speaker. The, um, the lower left one is actually like an impossible controlled uh, directivity speaker. So that would be one where the response is basically perfect in a certain window, we'll say plus or minus 30 degrees. And then everything outside of that, there's just no sound at all. And then the uh, absolutely impossible wide dispersion speaker there on the lower right is one where it basically sprays sound everywhere equally perfectly uh, with no variation at all. And so that, you know, this, this kind of shows you that what these plots would look like with different response types. Now, one thing I'll mention with CD speakers for those of you who are saying, well, okay, so if you're going to have some directivity to it, you're going to try to control that directivity, you're going to have some fall off, what's considered good? As long as you can keep the response basically pretty flat, and uh, lowering and level down to one kilohertz, you're doing pretty good. 500 hertz is really better. And that's what I would call a kind of like the, the proper limit. So any speaker that basically has a flat DI down to 500 hertz, I would call a very good CD speaker. Anything doing better than that is excellent. Like they just, they barely exist. I think there's only a small handful of any speakers on the market that can even do that. Is that when you're talking about a cardioid um, base? Yeah. Line? So the, there are, we'll get probably get into this more in some of the other ones, but the way in which you can control directivity below the point at which a waveguide works is with the directivity of the woofer itself. So a 12 inch woofer, roughly speaking, would still be able to control directivity down to about seven or 800 Hertz. A 15, a 15 inch woofer can expand that to between five and 600 Hertz. An 18 inch woofer is between four and 500 Hertz. And so you, you can, kind of see how it gets difficult. I mean, you'd be looking at like 21 inch woofers mm. being crossed over to waveguides just to be able to control it down to at that point, you're still only maybe looking at best at like 300, 350 Hertz. So to get any lower than that, you start to have to get into tricks because trying to rely on the woofers own sort of beaming, if you will, 
um, the narrowing of its dispersion naturally becomes increasingly difficult. And so the way to do that, yeah, is like cardioid loading. That's probably the best option. It's the most common that we see in the industry. Um, but doing that is expensive. You know, it adds usually at least uh, one extra driver uh, in order to be able to achieve that. And why would we even have to worry about that if we're doing multiple subs in a room anyways to flatten out the base? Yeah, I mean, it. it so it can be helpful to get the... So one of the reasons why you might do it is that you can get away with smaller woofers. So instead of trying to make a 21-inch woofer mate with a waveguide properly, you can just mate a 12-inch or a 15-inch woofer. Or, you know, there's the Dutch and Dutch, uh, for instance, or double Dutch 8Cs. That speaker uses cardioid loading. The Kai Audios uses cardioid loading. Those are using little you know, between six and eight inch mid bass drivers. And then they use the extra drivers. And, and in the case of the uh, HC, they also use the side cardio vents in order to allow that speaker to have um, uh, basically a flat DI down to about a hundred Hertz. Now you don't need it to go that low, but the point is it's an eight inch woofer and the DI stays flat to well below where you need it. So the other advantage of doing that trick is it allows you to use smaller woofers and still achieve that same improvement in directivity. Gotcha. So um, what is directivity matching? So here's where we're going to get into some practical knowledge that I think people need to understand. So directivity matching can probably be described best as the degree to which the directivity between the drivers is matched uh, or the same at the point of the crossover. So in other words, where the woofer is starting to beam, the tweeter also is essentially at the same point in its beaming, if you will, and they match each other. When there is a mismatch, the frequency response changes with angle. And so I've given you here an example of a normalized uh, frequency response plot of a speaker that does not have good directivity matching between the drivers at the crossover point. And so you see that the response is changing pretty dramatically as you go off axis. And this causes a bunch of problems. So one of them is that the reflections in the room, which are contributing to what you hear, are going to be totally different from that of the direct sound. And while I know a lot of people probably would try to argue things like, well, you can put absorbers up and it absorbs it. Well, you can try, but absorbers don't absorb 100% of the sound that hits them. The reflections are still pretty strong and uh, absorbers themselves actually don't have a flat absorption response uh, at a single incident angle. And so they too are further corrupting the response typically. So really you want the speaker to have as, as well a match directivity as possible so that, that response can uh, remains consistent as you move off angle and I just want to I just want to note that a lot of the old vintage speakers from the 70s and 80s this was not even a concept that they most of them even thought about that's why that's why you'd have a tweeter at the top right of the cabinet and mid ranges scattered all around the cabinet they weren't thinking about directivity matching they were at best I think they were looking at maybe an on axis frequency response and maybe a power response. But they didn't really know about this kind of stuff. This is the kind of research that was done. Uh, really, it was started at the NRC with Dr. Floyd Tool, and then carried over to, at Harmon, where Sean Olive and the other guys really got into uh, doing white papers on loudspeaker directivity and the benefits of early reflections and stuff like that. Yeah, it was really um, Floyd Tool's book and the papers that he was publishing, as well as Dr. Olgetti's. Um, and the work that he was doing, the two of them, I would say, were the biggest influences on me and my understanding of directivity uh, and, and paying attention to these polar responses. And it changed forever, basically, what I considered to be a good speaker. Um, and it also helped me actually learn to listen better, to be, kind of better understand what I'm looking for. There And there were speakers often that I thought were flawed, and I couldn't figure out why, because, you know, their on-axis response looked fine. And once I learned and understood about directivity, I started to find that a lot of these speakers did have a flat on-axis response, but they really did not as soon as you moved much more than 10 or 15 degrees off-axis. And, and that really helped me to better understand why there's so much more to speaker design than just that on-axis response. It also, this actually goes into room EQ. It's also why room EQ in and of itself is not a fix for bad speakers. EQ can't fix this. This is an acoustic problem. Right. And then the other thing to consider, too, is if you want a speaker that sounds good when you're sitting slightly off axis, if you have a multi row seat or multi um, front seat, front row and back row kind of stuff, and you're going from side to side, a speaker that looks like this with poor directivity matching is going to sound much, much different for each listener. Exactly. And actually, the future uh, presentations we're going to do will get into the idea of wide and narrow sweet spots, but certainly a part of that, too is uh, does the speaker have the same response, relatively speaking, 
at different listening positions. And if not, yeah, then different people are going to hear different things. And one of the, th I, you know, I work with, with folks on um, the acoustics in their rooms, and I would say at least half, if not more of the rooms I work on don't have an actual center listening position. Um, the uh, center listening position, so to speak, is the armrest. <laughs> and what that means is both both people, basically, the we'll call them the husband and the wife or the friends or whatever, are sitting slightly off axis and are essentially getting a worse response than they would have. So it makes it all the more important in a, in a theater like that, which I think are very pragmatic theaters, to have speakers that have a nice, consistent response across a range of angles. Yeah. So what causes directivity mismatches? Well, as I mentioned before, the piston size of a woofer affects when that woofer starts to beam. And so you can actually take advantage of that as a way of controlling dispersion or not. I mean, it depends on the goal of the speaker. And so where the speaker starts to um, have its response, we'll call beam or, or narrow, depends on that diameter of the driver. Now, there are other factors. Some people will notice when you look at different drivers that like three different eight inch drivers or three different six and a half inch drivers might have a, di a slightly different point. The profile of the cone can also matter the surround shape, you name it. But for the most part, it's the piston diameter that matters. And this dictates the, the point at which it starts to beam. And the, and the same is basically true for tweeters. So to some extent, how hard the tweeter is, the way in which the tweeter is shaped, all of that can affect it, the surround, um, the, any kind of waveguide it has. But a lot of it is also, you know, is it a one inch? Is it a three quarter inch? Is it a two inch? Whatever, that also affects it. And so directivity mismatching happens when the tweeter that you're trying to match up to the mid bass driver are starting to beam a different point. So a one inch dome tweeter typically has omnidirectional response, meaning the response doesn't change at all with angle up until about three kilohertz, uh, sometimes even a bit higher. So what that means is that if you cross it over to a woofer, if you can't cross at three kilohertz, you've got a problem. Uh, because you're going to have a directivity mismatch. And and in fact, so for those of you who I've heard this said a lot, they really don't like the sound of little woofers. They like the big six and a half inch or eight inch woofers. Well, absent a waveguide, it's going to be very difficult to get a one inch dome tweeter to properly match to a six and a half inch or eight inch driver. Uh, essentially, they won't. And think about the case with like a JBL M2, which is a 15 inch woofer and a giant horn. That speaker would not work if it didn't have that big waveguide on the tweeter. Yep. Absolutely. That waveguide is key to ensuring that those two match up. And in fact, the reason why it uses a 15 inch driver is because of the size of the waveguide. The two of them are sort of interrelated in that regard. So you have to choose both in that way. Anyone who's ever looked at my speakers, they always say the same thing. Why are they so big? Why do they have 12 inch woofers? It's not for a lot of bass. They actually don't have very much bass. It's not so they can play loud. It's because the 12 inch woofer matches the directivity of the 12 inch waveguide and the 12 inch waveguide was chosen because we were targeting a specific directivity index with the design of that speaker. Gotcha. Okay. That's a good point. And also you get more output. That's a bonus. That's it's not more a, sensitivity. <laughs> yep, exactly. Okay. So here's an example. So what I did was I simply took the images of a, uh, I think it was a peerless mid bass driver and a peerless tweeter. And I showed what would happen if I was to overlay them. So you can see these are mismatched for a bunch of reasons, but I overlaid them such that the, on axis response matched in both of them. So here's what happens if you try to match it uh, up too high. You can see that there's clearly a directivity mismatch where the tweeter basically is um, still basically omnidirectional for about a full octave more. Uh, and the mid bass driver has already started to have its response widen out. There's even, you can see there's some sort of a dip in the response. Probably you wouldn't see that in the finished speaker, but the widening for sure you would. So what you can see here is this speaker's final finished response, if you were to even optimize the crossover, even though you could probably achieve a pretty flat on axis response when all is said and done, you would not have good directivity matching. So we can go to the next one. Now this one you can see, it's the exact same mid bass driver, exact same tweeter. What I did was I shifted the crossover lower to the point at which the mid bass driver was still omnidirectional basically it wasn't widening at all so now you can see what looks like a nice flat response that would actually look like a halfway decent speaker if it was a real speaker and all i did actually was overlay the drivers so well, this is... one one important consideration when you do lower the crossover of the tweeter that tweeter has to be able to play down lower if it, does. it doesn't have a low enough, uh, resonant frequency and it doesn't have enough dynamic capability you will strain that tweeter and you will now create a new problem called distortion Absolutely. So it's not a free lunch. So directivity matching is a really important thing to uh, to get right. I would argue that it's more important 
than uh, getting the distortion low and the dynamic range. I, basically, what I would say is if you've got a speaker where you can't get the directivity matching right in order to achieve your target maximum SPL, you've got the wrong drivers. You know, you've just mm -hmm. designed the wrong speaker. So I, I would argue that directivity matching is the single most important part of speaker design and that if you get to that point where you can't cross it over low enough without having a rise in distortion, you've got to redesign your speaker around different drivers. Okay. All right, so directivity control. So we've been talking about the concepts of making sure there's good directivity match. Now these are the lexicon, I think it's called the SL1, hope that's right. Um, and this is essentially a DSP controlled uh, speaker. It's got drivers all around in a ring shape, as you can see. And why I chose this as an example of directivity control is this does not actually use horns or waveguides. It uses lots of drivers and sophisticated DSP in order to make it so that this speaker has not only very controlled uh, dispersion, you can change it. So there's an app basically that goes with thing that allows you to change the directivity index of the speaker for wider narrow dispersion and anything in between. So as I mentioned, directivity is the way in which a speaker sends sound in different directions. And directivity control really thus is the degree to which the sound radiation is being controlled over a specific set of angles. So as I mentioned before, like with my speakers, a directivity index was being targeted. They wanted the speaker's response, Dr. Geddes in this case, wanted the speaker's response to be narrowed. So that's a 90 degree speaker means that this response would, reflain, would remain relatively good over a plus or minus about, we'll say, 15, 20 degree uh, angle plus or minus. That's about, so that becomes about 40 degrees total. And then you get to a point where you're at about minus 60 Bs when you hit plus or minus 45 degrees and you get as a result of that, your 90 degree dispersion that was being targeted. So that's directivity control and that's what that means. Directivity control is typically defined as any measure used to restrict where the sound goes. So James Larson and I get into this argument all the time where he'll say, well, I don't know. I think any speaker that has a smooth off axis response has directivity control because they were paying attention to it. And I always argue, well, that's not really what that term means. So my understanding of the term and the way I see it used in the literature is the directivity control specifically refers to efforts made to narrow the dispersion from what it would naturally be Efforts made to uh, ensure a smooth off axis response, I would say, is just good speaker design. That's what everybody should be doing. Um, so, so a question for you on a speaker like this: um, mm -hmm. we had, we did, we did a presentation a while ago about the dangers of multiple tweeters because of acoustical interference. In this case, the tweeters are very closely spaced, but I would imagine that they're all maybe doing some DSP trickery in there yeah. as well to avoid that. Right? They're they're not all sharing the same bandwidth. Are they? No. So my understanding of how the speaker works, and I've, I mean, I've never even had my hands on them before, but as I understand how the concept for a speaker like this would work, um, every individual driver is individually driven and has an individual DSP channel. And that allows them to do not just changes in the bandwidth that they're playing. So yeah, they can shape the response so that they're covering a different frequency range. They can also change things like the level and the delay. And by affecting those three things, you can control the dispersion as necessary. Gotcha. Okay. So here is an example of what you might see with a speaker that has good but narrow dispersion. So this is the JTR Noesis 212. I reviewed this for another magazine. And uh, so I have these measurements for it. It's a good example of what a speaker might look like where you're seeing good dispersion control down to one kilohertz, which I mentioned was good. And then it starts to widen out to where at 500 hertz, it starts to hit what I would call relatively wide dispersion. So what you can see is over a 60 degree angle, the listeners are all hearing about the same thing. The response doesn't change a lot. So what that, if you think about that, that's actually pretty wide. So in a listening room, that would typically cover most, if not all of the uh, listening area that you would have in a typical theater. And so here I've got these guys in office chairs listening, and that's what they're hearing. As they go off to the sides, what you see is the response doesn't seem to change a lot. You're not seeing a lot of craziness going on. There's a little bit of whiskering, but it's not too bad. Um, it just gets quieter. And what that means is that it's kind of like putting absorbers on the sidewalls, um, but with a nice flat response. Basically, the reflections are the same frequency response as the primary sound, except that they are quieter. So a speaker like this, you would want to spread them out pretty wide and then maybe tow them in? 
Yeah, I mean, ideally, and I'll get into this in another uh, talk that we're doing, I would argue that you would not only tow them in, you would actually have them fire uh, so that they're crossing ahead of your listening, uh, the listener. And there's a trick, uh, it, it kind of takes advantage of a psychoacoustic effect known as time intensity training, train, trade, Ding, there trading, we go. Not, trading, trading yeah. not training. <laughs> Time and density trading to allow you to move around in the horizontal position and not have the center image change. So normally with typical speakers, if you aim them at the listener, the person in the center, here's the center image in the center. But as you move to the left or right, the center image will move with you. He's talking uh, about the phantom center, basically. The phantom center, right? The image. With um, This only works with speakers like these waveguide speakers, narrow dispersion speakers. If you aim them right, it, what happens is that as you move to the left or the right, the speaker is getting quieter, but you're getting closer. So actually, the level stays the same. And as a result of that, the center image doesn't move. It stays centered. And that's really good for especially movies where you've got a visual that's anchoring it. So if a guy is talking in the middle of the screen, Let's just say you don't have a home theater system with 5.1, but you do have a screen. The center image isn't moving around with that person who's speaking just because you're sitting off to the side. So it's, it's just a trick that happens to work with these kinds of speakers. Okay. All right. So here's a, what I would call a really good wide dispersion speaker. So in this particular case, we're looking at the uh, BMRs, the Philharmonic, uh, Philharmonitor BMRs. And this was one of the better probably one of the best wide angle speakers we'd ever measured. So what you can see here is, again, there's a little bit of whiskering, but for the most part, the it, I had shown you earlier, what would a perfect wide angle response look like? It would just be solid red. Well, that's not far off from solid red, right? It's pretty darn close. So in this case, you can see somebody can sit actually almost all the way out to 90 degrees, certainly over a plus or minus 60 degree window. And the tonal balance of the system doesn't change. So this is a very wide dispersion speaker. Now, um, one of the, well, I won't call it a disadvantage. One of the features of the speaker is that the reflections will be very strong. They're not being quieted. And so if, you know, for certain types of music, we get into this again a little bit more in some of the other um, presentations, like classical music or acoustic music, those strong reflections help you uh, to get a, a greater sense of spaciousness. And so it tends to sound more realistic. I would argue with studio music, it's less desirable. And you probably would find yourself with a speaker like this wanting to use pretty strong sidewall absorbers in order to make it sound more like what those studio recordings were intended to sound like. But I would counter that by saying, why not just use a narrower dispersion speaker? It's going to do a better job than those absorbers would have anyway. Well, I would tell you from my experience, and this is purely subjective, and we should probably do a separate video on this. Anytime I get something that's really narrow dispersion, like the speaker you just showed before, it always to me gives me that coloration in the mids like almost like a honky kind of sound like the the vocals are being beamed to your head Whereas yeah a, spe a speaker like this just sounds more natural it doesn't sound as nasally and i know so, on on paper i know that the the narrow dispersion speaker would give you that wider phantom center but i think personally it's a trade-off depending on what you're really looking for so i'd like to hear your thoughts on that well the honkiness is actually a known artifact of of I'm just going to say it's a, it's a known artifact of bad waveguide design. And so what you're really describing is a classic horn sound problem. And there's, we can, it's a, that, that is a whole nother topic to get into, but basically a lot of what caused those kind of classic horn sound problems have persisted to this day. in a lot of speakers that use horns and waveguides, giving them that honky coloration, which doesn't always show up in the frequency response. Um, Earl Geddes has done a lot of work on this. And so, you know, again, I, a lot of my influence came from what he taught me. He designed his oblate spheroid waveguide specifically to address one of the uh, primary problems he saw as causing that. So those old designs typically used a uh, diffraction slot, which causes a lot of uh, problems. And then also... Uh, tended to cause a lot of higher order modes or, or hums. And so he designed something that minimized the hums and didn't have to use a diffraction slot in order to maintain constant directivity. So he would argue, and my experience with his speakers has been, that his don't have that honky sound. The JBL M2 is another design that doesn't really use a classic diffraction slot. It's a more modern approach. And I don't hear that with those either. So I guess my argument would be 
you're right that that can be true, but it's not a it's not a wide versus narrow thing. It's a uh, more a problem caused by the feature being used to control dispersion, the horn. So as long as it's a sufficiently good quality horn, you shouldn't hear that. Okay. Well, we definitely will revisit this topic in another video. So here's what I would call a wide dispersion speaker, but it's not a good one. So I know I've picked on the B&Ws before, but Ouch. you can... Yeah, you can see though, I mean, yes, it's pretty wide up to about five kilohertz, but there's a whole lot of whiskering. You can see that the response narrows in the range between, we'll say about 800 hertz and um, three kilohertz, um, and then widens again. That's a mis mismatch between that very large, I believe it's a six and a half inch mid range and that tweeter. Again, you can it is impossible. You cannot match a six and a half inch uh, mid range driver to the directivity of a one inch dome tweeter without a waveguide cannot be done. And they've, that's what they've tried to do here. And you can unless see the effect. You the, unless you lower the tweeter crossover even more, right? To But you can't, yes, you're right, but you can't. There is no one inch dome tweeter that could be lowered that amount because it would need to be crossed over below one kilohertz for that really to work. You can see that here, the response is already yeah. starting to narrow by one kilohertz. So you would actually have to cross it over right around there. And they just don't make one inch dome tweeters that can handle that. Typically, you're lucky to get like maybe 1.8 kilohertz would be kind of the typical low end. Um, and yeah, well, basically, some of the best tweeters, the dome tweeters on the market, like the scan speaks, their resonant frequency is around 500 hertz. And you don't want to cross those over any more than about two to three times that, you know, so you want to do it at around yeah. 1.5 kilohertz. Like you said, it's it's very difficult to do a one kilohertz crossover on a one inch tweeter. And many that are as low as you're describing are actually larger than one inch. And so the response would also That's narrow true. somewhat. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. one and an eighth inch and one and a quarter inch is a common size for some like 30 millimeters is a very common dome tweeter size. That's actually, it's bigger by five millimeters than a typical one inch and they do go lower. So then the other issue though, that comes up with this particular tweeter is that the response starts to beam by five kilohertz, like aggressively. So the response gets very, very narrow. And this is not true, as I showed you with that BMR. This is not true of every speaker. Now, here's something else to consider. The other speaker I was showing you, the JTR, that actually had a narrow dispersion because of the waveguide, had a wider dispersion above 5 kilohertz than this thing does. Wow, that's interesting. I never thought I'd see a horn-loaded speaker have that kind of uh, property, like you're saying, compared to this. Right. Well, and this is just not, and this is not the only speaker like this. Um, when I was preparing the presentation, James Larson and I were going through a lot of different measurements and I kept referring to this as the bird beak effect. There's a lot of speakers out there that have this kind of bird beak effect uh, where the, the tweeter just starts to beam pretty aggressively. And I would argue that if it's above 15 kilohertz, probably not a big deal. But when it's starting as low as five kilohertz, I think that's problematic. So how does a company with all the resources of, of Bowers and Wilkins n not look at this and realize, hey, we should probably put a waveguide or do something different? I don't actually understand their speaker design. I really, I don't understand why they prioritize what they do. So it's hard for me to really answer that question because I can't, uh, they have a lot of resources and they put a lot into the design. A lot of their drivers are actually well designed for what they are. So it just kills me that this is the kind of stuff they produce. I mean, the, some people will say, oh, well, the 800 series has got to be better, right? The measurements are almost as bad. Hmm. But there is a there is a sonic signature people. They gravitate towards these kind of speakers. So maybe um, in an isolated listening environment where it's not multiple seats or something, um, it doesn't affect them as much. Certainly, if you are if you are on access to the uh, speaker, I mean, right on axis and you've got, especially if it's in like a studio type environment where you've got a lot of absorption, it probably would sound okay because the on axis actually in this particular case, the on axis response isn't great, but if you, there is a on axis, I shouldn't say that there is a listening axis response that isn't too bad. And if you kind of, Get that, get them aimed right to get that listening access response where it's pretty flat, and you've got a lot of absorption to absorb the reflections. Yeah, it's probably okay. And I know people, and I've heard them in you know in events and thought they sounded pretty decent too. But I, I happen to think other speakers for the same money or less sound better, and there are issues in the response as you can see and here. Maybe not, and maybe those other speakers aren't as finicky as placement as these would be. Yeah, these are pretty finicky. So actually, here's yeah. the what I was telling you guys. So this is that BMW, that Bowers and Wilkins speaker again. Look at that. Zero degrees, you've got a very wavy response. By 20 degrees, it's flattened out some. Um, 
by quite a bit. And and so that's what I was saying. You've actually got to find it. This is a speaker. We're towing it such that you're listening at 20 degrees, which pointing straight ahead probably would do that. Um, or you could aggressively tow it in. Either would work. Um, and, and that would give you a, a better listening experience. So one of the thing, one of the reasons why I wanted to explain to folks about the directivity index was to also show that on axis isn't always, isn't always best. And once you start to understand directivity, you can start to understand what it takes to find the optimal listening axis. But then you can also see the problem when you have an inconsistent off axis response. So if you do point the speaker at you and that's what you're listening to, especially with a lot of the modern theater systems that are using like, Odyssey or direct, that's going to flatten that response right out. Well, look at what it's going to then do to the other response that I'm showing at 20 degrees, which isn't even what the first reflection would be. The first reflection response actually gets worse than this. So um, what happens when you correct this is that the response gets really bad at, and the reflections themselves become more and more colored. Yeah. So guys, look at our uh, room EQ um, videos that we did. We talk really in great detail about this, how when a speaker actually has poorer measurements, the room EQ uh, does worse results for it. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Yeah, that was the whole thing. That was what I wanted to cover. So we're going to, that was just to kind of explain the, the, what directivity is and how it matters. And then the goal in the next two is going to be to talk about wide versus narrow. And, and I'm going to get more into that idea of uh, time intensity uh, trading and how it applies even in a home theater. So I know I was giving examples that probably a lot of people were saying, well, I have a home theater. It doesn't matter. You had mentioned that too, Gene. And, and the answer is the center image thing may not matter as much, but image stability, because there's still a lot of phantom images, even in a home theater. So in a home theater, you've got your left speaker, your center, and your right. And the, uh, the phantom image still you have between the left and the center and the center and the right. So you want stability there for different listeners. But then there's huge phantom images that are created um, through the surround speakers. So not only in the transition from the front speakers to those back surrounds, but also from the left surround to the right surround, there's, you know, you want that, that movement of image of objects, I should say, to be consistent and the same for every listener. And it needs to be in the right position. You don't want to be watching some movie where a helicopter flies from behind you overhead over to the front and you're in the center and you hear it correctly. And the guy to left you hears it, you know, so it's coming from the wrong place, which is what typically would happen. So by controlling the dispersion of the speaker and aiming them correctly, you can actually improve the number of seats that would hear the same thing. So one of the reasons why you see in commercial cinemas that they always use horns, basically waveguides, is for that reason. But they can apply in home theaters too, which is one of the reasons why THX made such a big deal about directivity, dispersion of the speaker, and why so many of those speakers used either multiple tweeters or waveguides. So you. this is an interesting question. I'm gonna we're not gonna answer too many questions because we're going over time. Um, we could do that later after this is done. But I just wanted to pop this one up about omnidirectional speakers. How does this apply to omnidirectional speakers? Yeah, well, it's just another case. So I was I was mostly talking about wide dispersion in terms of those which would have an even response out over 180 degrees. But actually, there's special cases. And I get into that in the next presentation, but where you can actually have a speaker that has a flat power response, which means it has a even response over the entire 360 degrees. So what does that do? Well, subjectively, the wider the, the dispersion, the stronger the reflections, and the stronger, essentially, the reflections relative to the direct sound will be. So the direct to reflected sound ratio goes down. Now, what does that do subjectively? So what I've read and what I've heard. So I'm going to say, like, what I heard, I've now had, I, I've had other people confirm who are experts in this, in this field, is that when those reflections are stronger, it increases spaciousness. And it also increases something known as the apparent source width. Now, what does that mean? If you think of a band sitting in front of you, or you think of, well, the band is the easy one, we'll just say a band sitting in front of you, the, the um, size of the room that the band is playing in is dictated by these spatial effects. And so the room sounds bigger when you have a lot of those reflections. And then the band itself also sounds bigger and more spread out. But there's another thing that happens, which is that it becomes more diffused. So basically, the omnidirectional speakers tend to create a really big image, and they make the room sound really big. But the, the kind of specificity of any piece in that sound stage is very low. So it's hard to pinpoint where the bass player is, where the drummer is, et cetera. And it la basically, it lacks intimacy is what I've heard in a lot of speakers like this. It just doesn't. For have sure. That. 
Yeah. It's it's kind of the opposite of that. It's more like being in a big venue. So that's why I was saying, if you're listening to, so to, another example of this in real life would be an orchestra. So if you're listening to a symphony, symphonies don't have these precise sound stages. Nobody sits in a symphonic hall and says, oh, I can hear the violin section over there and the drums over there. You know, it, that's just not how it works. Everything kind of blends together and it's just big and spacious. And so that's what you want to hear if you're trying to reproduce that in your room, which is why having an overly intimate system won't sound good. But as much as I like listening to symphonic music, the vast majority of what I listen to is actually studio recordings, which are the opposite of that, where I want that greater intimacy and specificity. Yeah. Well, I, I think we're going to wrap this up. The one thing I'd like to say is, Matt, you just kind of gave me an idea of a video that we need to do or you need to do is setting up loudspeakers for two channel based on uh, you know positional um, recommendations based on their dispersion characteristics. So if you have a speaker with a wide dispersion, how would you place these in a room versus mm -hmm. a speaker with narrow dispersion? I think that would sure. be like a good kind of overview if you can illustrate it and show a picture of a speaker and then show how you would place them in a room for each type of uh, speaker product and we could do a separate video on that like maybe a 10 minute video so it doesn't lose people sure yeah that shouldn't be too hard to do so i just volunteered you for more work working through it all right guys well we're going to wrap this up um we're going to we're going to bring matt into the user comments later to answer some of these questions that you guys have i'm volunteering him for that as well because this is the kind of stuff he loves and we're going to do two more parts, uh, like Matt was saying. We'll probably do them later this week. And um, so we could break this up into three parts, and then I'll link them all together into a playlist so you guys can reference them. And like I said before, the slide presentations will be on our Patreon. So make sure you join our Patreon at patreon.com slash audioholics. Matt, thank you for putting this together. I really appreciate the education that we're getting here on loudspeaker directivity and just to understand better how speakers work and play into real listening rooms. No problem. All right, guys. Until next time, keep listening. <laughs> <laughs>